So in this segment, we're going to be talking about this article from Jonathan uh, Friedland. He says, Jacob Rees-Mogg has given the game away. Even this government knows Brexit is a, is a disaster. This is predominantly around the change of import check rules that were meant to come in force this year. Uh, we've spoken about this a lot because it's, it's big news. You know, the UK basically admitting that we can't do physical checks on imports like the EU is. This article was written on Friday the 29th of April, so this was before the local elections. He does kind of talk about them, but not in depth, obviously, because they hadn't happened yet. So let's have a look at this one. The definition of a gaffe is when a politician accidentally tells the truth. So ruled the veteran Washington uh, journalist Michael Kinsley. And um, Mogg accidentally told the truth, really, that import checks would cost a billion um, pounds to businesses. And um, that's a Brexit cost, really, isn't it? Morg announced that the government was delaying yet again the imposition of post-Brexit border checks on imports from the EU. He asked the public to celebrate this decision on the grounds it would save a billion a year and help hard-pressed consumers by avoiding an increased an increase in the cost of imported food. Now, we've spoken previously about this, a 70% increase in the cost of uh, small quantities of cheese, for example. Enforcing post-Brexit checks said the minister would have been an act of self-harm, so he's admitting there that Brexit is an act of self-harm. You read that right, Mog Archlever, long-time loather of the EU because it's a uh, protectionist cabal, is now parroting lines from the Remain campaign. Oh, He's admitting that implementing Brexit in full, honouring the 2016 promise to take back control of Britain's borders, would be an act of self-harm. It's a bit awkward, isn't it? There's plenty to attack here, starting with the nerve of hailing this move as saving Britons £1 billion, when this was £1 billion that Britons would never have had to spend at all because of Brexit. There would be no customs checks, no uh, quotas, uh, or customs, SPS, any of that stuff. On imports or exports of EU goods. Or you could share the outrage of British farmers appalled that thanks to Brexit they have been left at a serious competitive disadvantage, which is true that you know um, it's easier to export meat to the UK than it is for EU, uh, the EU to export meat to the EU, for example. They now face onerous and costly checks when they ship their goods across the channel. The French, Italian or Spanish farmers face no such hassle moving their products in the other direction, but they do. They are facing customs and some issues, but nowhere near as bad. Or you could worry along the along with the British Veterinary Association, which warns that not checking food imports leaves Britain exposed to catastrophic animal diseases such as African swine fever, a risk that was reduced when Britain was part of the EU's integrated and highly responsive surveillance systems. Now it's not perfect because there are um, outbreaks of this African swine fever in places like Germany and uh, Greece, for example. But, you know, we'd be far more aware of these outbreaks because the EU has databases, so it's easier for them to contain it. And whilst we're not aware of these outbreaks, you know, it's very easy for that stuff to get into the UK via other countries because we don't have access to the same data the EU has. Or you could join the lament of the UK major ports group whose major whose members have spent hundreds of million pounds uh, building checking facilities, which now stand um, unused. We've spoken about that as well. He and his fellow Brexiters once uh, looked forward to these border checks. I I don't think they did, honestly. I I really don't. Seeing them as merely a price, seeing them not not merely as a price worth paying for leaving the EU, but as a genuine benefit. You know, the MP for Dover um, said, you know, it's bringing a lot of investment to the port of Dover, which is true, but it's also bringing a lot of traffic and pollution. So I hope you're enjoying that at the White Cliffs. Britain would not would be would at last be free to set its own food standards superior to the EU's. Yet we are looking like we're going to deregulate, and yet now the minister admits that putting up barriers just makes food more expensive for British consumers and risks bankrupting British farmers. Precisely the act of self harm Remain has always said it would be. Also, the fact that British farmers don't benefit from the uh, EU subsidies anymore, and they have to uh, you know they're going to earn a lot less, especially the English ones, via the subsidies. The irony of hearing Monk declare that free trade is hugely advantageous to consumers after he and his comrades pulled us out of the largest, most successful free trade bloc in the world, the European single market. And, you know, this isn't just, you know, a free trade agreement type thing. This is absolutely no checks on goods moving from GB to um, France, for example. Now, with our free trade agreement, there's still customs, vet checks, SPS, etc. They still come with costs. There are non-tariff barriers, essentially. 
At a stroke, the First Minister for Brexit Opportunities had implicitly admitted that there are none, or at least very little, any opportunities are outweighed by the cost so great they represent self uh, economic self-mutilation, which is true that people have said that Brexit is the biggest uh, example of economic supper coup they have ever seen. In the long story of Britain's needless pointless departure from the EU, the Rees Mogg admission should count as a milestone, which is true. Um, you know, he goes on to say, for Brexit was this government's founding purpose, which is true. They ran a whole election on it. You know, everything was, um, you know, how are you going to reform the NHS? Get Brexit done. Um, why do you sleep with my wife? Get Brexit done. All this stuff, you know. If the two usual determinants of an incumbent administration popularity um, are the economy and personal standing of the leader, those now combined to be dangerous for the Tories, which is true. Johnson's um, opinion ratings in the toilet. Same with uh, Rishi Sunak. The cost of living crisis is both deep and wide, reaching into families that had previously been getting by, albeit with a struggle, you know, they're just about managing the jams, as Theresa May would call them. But it's also impacting, you know, lower middle class families as well. The energy costs are astronomical at the moment. Um, but this crisis runs in parallel with Partygate, each revolution of indulgence in Downing Street affronting not only those who follow the rules and deny themselves contact with loved ones during lockdown, which is true, Partygate disaster. The usual alibis are no longer working. The much trumpeted vaccine rollout is dead. Um, they touted that as a Brexit benefit. It wasn't. Witness this week high, the High Court ruling that discharging people from hospitals into care homes was irrational and unlawful, another example of where the government broke the law. A new poll shows a sharp decline in the number of voters ready to forgive those early decisions because they're glad they got the jab, which, you know, if those voters do turn on the Tories, it's very dangerous for them. On almost every issue from inflation to immigration, tax to housing and the NHS, big majorities think the government is handling things badly. Only on defence and terrorism do the Tories get positive remarks. No wonder they hail Boris, as, Boris Johnson as a leader on Ukraine because that's all they have. Without the Ukraine, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, Boris Johnson's um, opinion rating would probably be far lower than it already is. And it's pretty bad now. And yet, with the evidence, while the evidence is strong, many voters are making the break from the government. They are not fully sold on the alternative, because that's the key. They need to leave the incumbent, you know, the Tories, and go to the opposition parties, hopefully Labour. But, you know, Labour need to offer something as well. The old line says it's governments that lose elections rather than oppositions that win them. But changing government is a two-stage process. First, the electorate moves away from the incumbent party, then it moves towards the challenger. Labour and Starmer have a lot of work to do on that second stage, you know. They didn't win a lot of seats, but I think it was mainly Labour seats that were up for grabs anyways. But the first phase is well underway, and Rhys Mogg's accidental truth revealed one reason why. And we've seen the Lib Dems and the Greens do very well. And for anyone who argues, oh, the incumbents always do bad at, you know, kind of midterm elections, that's not true. Tories actually did quite um, well in previous elections, you know, in... Um, in council ones and also the SNP have gained I think it's 22 councillors in um, Scotland and I think they've been in charge of Scotland since like 2013 so it's not the strongest the arguments they're making but um, anyways let me know what you think in the comments below like comment share subscribe support the channel on Patreon if you can and hopefully I'll see you in the next one